Good morning, everybody. Welcome to your PCC course on fibroid. Uh, I like to introduce myself because you can see today we haven't got any chairman. This is the new system of S3. Uh, I just want to introduce myself. I worked in England for almost 30 years in Sheffield before moving back to Hong Kong a couple of years ago. And it's my great pleasure to be able to come back and uh, share with you uh, a very interesting topic on fibroid, especially on the indication for uh, fibroid surgery. Uh, now, the emphasis for my lecture is on indication. Um, I like to say that removing a fibroid is surgery. For any surgery, there must always be an indication. A Mac Thorax nearly 100 years ago mentioned that there are two unforgivable sins of any surgery. The first great error is to operate unnecessarily. And the second error is to undertake an operation for which the surgeon is not sufficiently skilled to doing the operation. So our discussion today will focus on the first one, the first issue, the indication. And that is a very controversial area, I have to say. You would hear from the discussion later on that there are a lot of controversies. So my discussion will focus on the evidence that we currently have on this subject. And I'd like to cover three areas. The available evidence that we have today. Then the second is the missing evidence. Why is it missing? And where can we find it? And the third piece of evidence is the underused or often forgotten evidence about the subject. Let's first of all talk about the available evidence that we have. Submucous fibroid. It's not controversial. You can see from this meta-analysis from Pritz uh, that submucous fibroid is associated with a significant reduction in clinical pregnancy rate, implantation rate, ongoing pregnancy rate, and uh, increase in miscarriage rate, all from here, a significant increase. So no controversies. There is also no controversies regarding removal of submucous fibroid. There are two control studies which show that if you remove submucous fibroid, you would increase or double the pregnancy rate. So I think most people, nearly everybody agreed, when you have a submucous fibroid, doesn't matter how small or how big it is, it ought to be removed because it significantly affects the outcome and that removal would improve it. However, in the case of intramural fibroid, the situation is very different. I have to explain to you that there are three meta-analyses in a short space of time on the subject. The first meta-analysis by Pritz on, met on the intramural fibroid would tell you that intramural fibroid, which did not distort the cavity, is associated with a significant reduction in pregnancy rate, light birth rate, and increase in miscarriage rate, as shown in here. And that, that was based on 16 studies. So that seems quite obvious. And very quickly, there was a second meta-analysis in the London group on a similar subject. And they further showed that if you consider light birth rate, which is a more refined outcome endpoint, that there's also a significant reduction in light birth rate in women with intramural fibroids. That seems all clear. However, when we in Sheffield were looking at the evidence, we were a little concerned about the heterogeneity and the quality of the study included in the meta-analysis. There is a saying that rubbish in, rubbish out. If you do a meta-analysis and include all the studies, and if some of the studies are rubbish, it would dilute the quality of your meta-analysis. So we, along with Cindy Farquhar, uh, attempt to look at all the data again and include only a high quality study in our third meta-analysis. And what we found in our third meta-analysis is that surprise, surprise, intramural fibroids that does not distort the cavity did not seem to affect the light birth rate, as you can see here on the, on the forest plot. Moreover, when you look at the miscarriage rate, 
It just about affect the miscarriage rate that did not reach statistical significance. The reason why I want to show you this three meta-analysis is that even though you look at the data, when you analyze it according to different standards, if you include only the high quality studies, you might come out with a different conclusion. So the jury is still out for the impact of intramural fibroid on uh, reproductive outcome. The conclusion I have from, from all this is that not all available evidence are admissible. Some are, some are not. Now let's look at another question, which is about removing the fibroid. Does it improve the outcome? Which is quite different to whether or not the presence of a fibroid adversely affects the outcome. This is about intervention, whereas the earlier question is about observation. So when you look at this, you will see from the literature data, there are very little study, one or two study, on the impact of myomectomy on the outcome. And you can see that because these studies are small and they did not come up with any significant impact. So therefore, we do not have literature data to support that removing fibroid improved outcome. However, we can say that these evidence are not sufficient. The reason being, uh, of course, they might be small, their number might be small, and therefore, when you take all the literature data together, these are what I would conclude up to now. Submucous fibroid adversely affect reproductive outcome. No debate. Removing submucous fibroid improve outcome. Quite obvious. We all agree. There is insufficient high-quality study on the impact of fi intramural fibroid on reproductive outcome. And there is also insufficient evidence on the impact of myomectomy on reproductive outcome. Now let's then move on to our next group of evidence, what I would call the missing evidence. Now, when I say missing, I know most people sitting here would say, well, if the intramural fibro is more than five centimeter, perhaps it ought to be removed. I know if I have a vote, I think at least half of you sitting here would probably say, yes, that's what we should do. Why do we say this? Because there was a study early on in London. It tells us it, this is the impact of intramural fibroids more than five centimeter on IVF outcome. Implantation rate significantly reduced. Pregnancy rate significantly reduced. Ongoing pregnancy rate significantly reduced. So therefore, the conclusion correctly was that large intramural fibroid negatively affect the outcome after IVF. That's correct. However, we need to be clear about what that means. The association of a large intramural fibroid with poor reproductive outcome does not necessarily imply that removing it would improve the outcome. If you remove the, the fibroid, it is quite possible you might make things even worse. Who say that removing a large fibroid would improve the outcome? There is no evidence at all. So myomectomy, Maybe we're not so sure. So you are offering surgery for this group of patients because you think it's going to help them, but it isn't because of firm grade A evidence in the literature that tells you that removing it could improve the outcome. So we have to be quite clear. Then let's talk about the smaller fibroids. In other words, the fibroids that are less than five centimeter. There is another study um, that suggests that if you have smaller fibroid, less than five centimeter. In a symptomatic patient selected for IVF, smaller fibroid not approaching the endometrial cavity did not affect the pregnancy rate and live birth rate. Now, because of this study, a lot of us would say, well, if the fibroid is less than five centimeter, please do not operate, because there is no evidence that it is affecting the outcome. Is it really the case? Well, I have to make a statement, first of all, that there is no evidence of significant impact does not imply there is evidence of no impact. The two are quite different. There are only two studies, not sufficiently powerful to show difference, 
actually there might be a benefit in removing smaller fibroid, let's say medium-sized fibroid, three to five centimeter. But because this study group all the fibroids together, and therefore the very small fibroid, like one, two centimeter, might have diluted the impact of the medium-sized fibroid. So myomectomy, should we be doing it? Our conclusion be we can't be sure because it's only one study and it group, group, group all the fibroids together. So when should a fibroid be removed? More than three, more than four, five, six, seven? The reality, and to be honest, we do not have the necessary evidence to guide us. We don't. Why is the evidence still missing? Well, I can tell you that the most important reason is there are so many confounding variables when you're thinking about whether a fibroid affects the outcome and whether removing a fibroid could improve the outcome. For example, the exact location, I'll show you that uh, the, the, uh, in the picture why. The number, sometimes it's not just one, sometimes there might be two, three, four, five fibroids, very often. Age of the woman is a significant confounder, whether there is any coexisting infertility factors, concurrent fertility treatment, the reproductive history, for example, whether the woman has got repeated miscarriages or repeated IVF failure is important. Who did the operation? What are the technique use? What about the follow-up duration, which is the impact on the outcome, of course. We all know cumulative conception rate is a more sensitive a more accurate indicator than a follow-up at a, at a, without a, a reference to the duration of follow-up. And the biological behavior of the fiber also is important. When I say that, there are not many good quality studies that examine the functional relevance of fibroid. There are a little bit of data on whether or not fibroid, especially near to the junction of song, affect uterine contractility. And we know that contractility does affect the outcome of embryo transfer. And we have very little data on this, the functional relevance of a fibroid. So for all these reasons, the missing evidence, uh, we still have the missing evidence. Now I mentioned about the location. I want to show you this. This is a picture of the uterus. And this is the endometrial cavity. And this is, this is the uh, endometrium. And here is the junctional zone. All right, and this is the outer myometrium. The junctional zone, is a very important part of the uterus. We do not understand enough about the junction of song and its function on the reproductive outcome. When you are looking at fibroids, when we say intramural fibroid, you can see this is an intramural fibroid, this is intramural fibroid, this is intramural fibroid, that is also intramural fibroid. But the distance they are away from the junction of song is quite different. This is miles away from the junctional zone. This is actually sitting in the junctional zone. Now, of course, when it affects the junctional zone, it affects the contractility, it affects the functionality, so close to the place where the, M, the, uh, the placenta is implanting. So they are very different. When we talk about intramural fibroid, we do not talk about the distance between the cavity and the fibroid and how far it is away from it. And this is why when we talk about intramural fibroid, we are talking a number, a variety of different fibroids with our reference, uh, with our understanding exactly how they each affect the outcome. This is a case history which I want to share with you, uh, a lady that I manage in Sheffield, a 33-year-old woman, four centimeter fibroid, two first trimester miscarriages, one of which occurred in the second trimester. One of my colleagues refused to do the operation for her because she's, she said, you only have a four centimeter fibroid. The literature says if you have more than five centimeter, I'll do it for you. But because you're only four centimeter, I'm not doing it for you. So she had another miscarriage and she came to me and then day after had a myomectomy and fortunately enough, she had a successful term pregnancy. I know this is a case history, this is anecdotal evidence, but I just want to share with you these type of cases. Um, and a challenge to surgeons and epidemiologists is that we ought to be collecting good evidence and also correctly interpreting the evidence. Well, I say this because 15 years ago, when I first joined SIG in reproductive surgery 
and for S3, there were about 10 of us from different countries in Europe sitting down, planning a multi-center study in Europe, 10 different countries. We want to ask the question, should, could when should myomectomy be performed and would myomectomy improve the outcome? I can tell you we discussed for 9 to 12 months. At the end, we didn't proceed because we realized during the process of discussion, the confounding variables, and we knew at the time that if we were to press on with the study, it would not be a good one because there's so many missing jigsaws in planning this prospective randomized control trial. So at that time, we make a decision. This is an estuary, SIG. Collect bad evidence is just as bad, if not worse, than not having any evidence at all. Now, this is a big decision. I hope before long, uh, uh, we would be able to group together and when we understand the fine more, we'd be able to plan ahead with uh, prospective multi-center multi randomized trial before long. So my last group of evidence that I want to present to you is the underused or often forgotten evidence. I want to show you this. Uh, before I show you, I want to share with you, I believe that the surgeon's responsibility continues long after the sutures are out. We quite often for, forgotten about this. In the discussion about indication for surgery, we have to bear in mind the surgeon has the ultimate responsibility. Beware of the complications. What do you think about this myomectomy? Laparoscopic myomectomy. Awful. If one of my trainees do a myomectomy like this, open a myomectomy 10, 20 years ago, I would say, do not do surgery, do not do gynecology, go and do radiology, go and do cardiology, go and do psychiatry, but gynecology is not for you. But have you seen this type of, not, might not be so bad, have you seen myomectomy like this after a laparoscopic and myomectomy, and you feel, well, I think definitely it could be done better. How often have you forgotten that it is so important to do a proper suturing after surgery? Well, this is a lady whom I managed in Hong Kong very recently. She had a myomectomy. And she was referred to me because after the myomectomy at a follow-up, this is what happens in the myometrium, fundal myometrium. What do you think that is? This is a gap. This is due to poor healing of after the myomectomy. This is the fluid collected in the fundus. If she were to conceive, she had ruptured uterus, no doubt. So the surgeon had wisdom of referring her to me for repairing of this herniation or uh, uh, gap in the, in the myometrium after a myomectomy. A surgeon's responsibility continues long after the sutures is out. We have to bear in mind. It also raises the question of, when and who should we follow them up after a myomectomy? Because we know rupture of the myomectomy scar is not uncommon, especially in these days when we're doing more and more laparoscopic surgery. In the literature, there are quite a bit of evidence about risk factor for uterine rupture after a laparoscopic myomectomy. There are two recurrent themes. One is excessive use of electrocautery. The second is poor suturing techniques. This is one of the uh, uh, publication, and there's another similar publication which come to this similar conclusion. This is two years after the first one. Seven cases of uterine rupture, and they analyzed that the data. Again, excessive use of electrocautery and poor suturing techniques contributed to the rupture of the uterine scar. This is a case history. A 38-year woman this is one that I managed in Sheffield, experienced chronic pelvic pain ever since the myomectomy, and required regular strong analgesics and frequent time off work. So what has happened? This is what happened when you do a second look uh, laparoscopy. The bowel is well stuck down to the place of the previous myomectomy. It's very, very much so. She had developed adhesions. Adhesions after myomectomy is very common, especially over the posterior wall of the uterus. It occurs in more than 80 to 90% of cases. 
And in this study, published in human reduction, gynecological uh, uh, surgery, despite the use of an adhesion barrier, icodextrin, adhesion still occur in 76%, three quarters of the women, and the average number of adhesion was 2.7. So it is a very common complication. We mustn't lose sight that surgery causes complications. And the consequence of poor healing or poor suturing are these. One is increased adhesions, which may cause pain, another complication, and impaired healing result in scar rupture. So surgical technique is very important in addition to the indication. Fibroid near the corneal region, again, we don't often remember when, when we are doing it, doing a removing fibroid near the corneal region, we must incise it as far away from the corneal as possible, otherwise it might then result in uh, tubal fertility. A small fibroid over the corneal region not causing obstruction of the tube may be better off undisturbed because you might convert a fibroid into a mechanical infertility problem. There is another case history what I want to share with you, a 32-year woman who become a menorrheic after myomectomy. When you do FSH, normal, you start out normal. A progesterone challenge test was normal too. Well, sorry, not when I say normal, negative, no period. An XCG was not possible because there was no uterine cavity. So why did that happen? Well, this is the fibroid that she had. And after the surgery, this was what happened on the right-hand side. The cavity was sutured together, whereas it should be properly sutured like this. Now, how often does it happen? I've seen a few cases like this. So this is why whenever you got a fibroid that you had to cut through the whole uterine cavity, when you enter the uterine cavity, it is so important that you do the suturing very carefully. Many surgeons would advocate converting a laparoscopy into a laparotomy in order to make sure that you suture it and it doesn't happen on, uh, like this on this case. It will be very difficult to treat, I can tell you, once the cavity has been completely obliterated. There is also 1 to 2 percent risk of hysterectomy due to uncontrolled bleed. This is a case that happened in Sheffield, in my hospital, 28 year woman who underwent myomectomy, operation performed by a trainee supervised by a consulting colleague of mine. Three hours after the operation, there was drop in urine output, five hours, drop in blood pressure, seven hours, the hemoglobin was 3.7. Immediate laparotomy, there was a big hematoma in the uterus, she ended up hysterectomy. I was called that evening and said, TC, could you go and see her first thing in the morning? Uh, I think she needs your help. Wow, how can we help her? She will need a surrogate if you want a baby. You can see the upset of a woman who come to the hospital, who want to have fibroid removed she, because she want a baby, and she woke up to have the uterus removed. Very upset, undoubtedly. But in the literature, it occurred in 1 to 2% of women. So we have to bear all this in mind. The one who does not operate does not have complications, of course. If you don't do operation, you don't have complications. So unfortunately, that concept would make some of us a bit more timid, a bit unreluctant to do operation, or rather more conservative. We must remember, however, that leaving the fibroid behind may create, might store up problems for the future. Leaving the fibroid behind may create problems for the, for the future. There's a good review article. There are a number of complications uh, if you have fibroid uh, during pregnancy. One of them is a preterm labor. You can look at that. Preterm labor is significantly increased from 7 to 8% to 11%. You might seem, you might, you might see that, that difference might seem to be not very big. But if you have looked after women with severe preterm labor, having a very badly, uh, having a baby with cerebral palsy because of severe prematurity, or if you look at people with red degeneration of fibroid during the mid-trimester and lost a baby, for example, around 18 weeks, 19 weeks, 20 weeks, the upset for the woman is very significant, very severe. So we mustn't lose sight that it could create problem. 
There is a special situation which also occurred in my hospital in Sheffield. A patient had a four centimeter anterior wall intramural fibroid, conceived, oblique lie, she had an emergency section, a, the fibroid has grown to six centimeter in a lower segment. My consulting colleague was doing the operation at the time, but she had great difficulty in delivering the baby, and the patient lost eight liters intraoperatively and had a cesarean hysterectomy. Now, why do I want to share with this case? I know there are many anecdotal ones, but the point that I want to make is if the fibroid is in the lower anterior location, maybe next time around when we see this fibroid, you have to think about you should have a lower threshold of removing it because next time around, when you're a patient like this, when she's pregnant, if she doesn't need quite a cesarean section, it could become very difficult. Another fibroid in a fundal region of posterior wall, maybe it's not so difficult because it's not in the way of doing a cesarean section. So location is very important. So, sum up, talking about evidence of myoma in reproduction, we need more. Let us have more evidence. And just to sum up what I've just said so far, and the subject, there's some good evidence, not a lot. There are many gaps in knowledge, the problem is significant heterogeneity of the biological behavior of the fibroid and it presents a, a special challenge. There are multiple outcome measures. Randomized controlled trial, I have to say, is not the only answer. We need more basic study. We need more better carefully designed study and individualized decision, especially as we're going to talk about later on the risk of myosarcoma. That should also be borne in mind. If you have a patient that you're worried about myosarcoma, perhaps that will be an additional indication for the surgery. Now, I would like to move on and, and perhaps set a scene for the, our next talk by my good friend Geddes, because whilst I talk about surgery, Geddes is going to talk about the, a non-surgical approach to, to fibroid. Surgery, I have to say, is an admission that medical treatment has failed or not possible. If we have simpler approaches, non-surgical non approaches, maybe that's an advancement. So Gaddis would talk about that, but just before I finish, I just want to say that a good surgeon learns how to operate. We spend a lot of time learning how to do surgery properly, but a great surgeon knows when to and when not to operate. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Lee, for this uh, kind review. And now the, the paper is open for discussion. So I would like to know if, uh, when you decide to perform a surgery, if you uh, take into account the FIGO classification of the myoma. And for example, in type 2 uh, myoma, what do you think about the hysteroscopic surgery uh, when compared to the laparoscopic surgery, because in certain teams, laparoscopic is also proposed in uh, type 2 myoma. Thank you so much. Uh, I, um, uh, clearly, I've been focusing on the indication of the fibroid, but if you're talking about the surgical approach, uh, I could say that, yes, it is a very important consideration to you. My personal prejudice or preference for type 2 submucous fibroid is to do it hysteroscopically, if at all possible. Firstly, if you do it laparoscopically, almost certainly you have to go through the whole thickness of the uterine wall, and with it, there will be an increased risk of scar rupture in the future. And also, many surgeons in that case would prefer to do a laparotomy. Not everybody would, would, would conform to that view, but I think a lot of people would say because the whole thickness has been has cut through, and just to reduce the risk of scar rupture, they would then do a laparotomy, just make sure that they suture correctly like the figure that I shown to you. However, when you do a hysteroscopic myomectomy, then you do not go through the whole layer of the uterus, so you have still got the outer myometrial layer intact. Now, sometimes it is difficult when it's very deep, then you worry about the risk of perforation of the uterus. 
And that's when ultrasound guidance is so important. So you need to do it under ultrasound guidance to know exactly how much uh, safety margin that you have. And of course, it's not just intraoperative ultrasound guidance. The preoperatively mapping out the exact location of fibroid is important. And nowadays, I would certainly do a fibroid mapping using 3D before the surgery, precisely determine where it is and how much uh, safety margin there is. Now, if the safety margin is small, meaning less than five millimeter, then we have two options. One is you can continue doing it under strict ultrasound guidance. And the second is that you can do it in a two-stage procedure. In other words, you can remove the main bulb, maybe 80%, 90% of the fibroid, leaving a little bit behind. And very interestingly, after a few weeks, you'll see the myometrial contraction. It will push the fibroid further out into the cavity. And then you can then uh, do it at a subsequent, maybe six weeks to eight weeks' time. And you will find that it, with that, it will become uh, much easier. So I think there are different approaches, but in short, my preference would be to try and do it by hysteroscopic approach, if at all possible, rather than doing a laparoscopic approach. Okay. I hope that uh, answers your question. Okay. Yes, the, the, I think that Professor Krasinski has a question, and after Professor Gortz. Uh, thank you. Congratulations, TC. Uh, perhaps after the questions, I may no longer be on your friends list on Facebook. So I have two questions. Uh, one concerns epidemiology, and the other concerns what you've just mentioned, fibroid mapping. Uh, uh, let me ask the easy one. Concerning epidemiology, have we seen any change in the epidemiology of uterine fibroids with respect to the confounding variable age? Because you and I use textbooks that said women who have fibroids are fertile, 40, and there's another word I can't remember. Fat. Ah, thank you, thank you. I'm too polite to but say But I know fat. you want you want me to right. say this. So, no. I know. So, so has anything changed because the age of women having babies is is getting higher? And uh, the other question concerns fibroid mapping. Um, surgeons are excellent surgeons. They may not be excellent ultrasonographers even with 3D. Who should do the fibroid mapping optimally? Who should, which modality? Should it be ultrasound? Should it be MRI? Should it be CT? So, best optimal method of fibroid mapping and epidemiology. Okay, well, th first question. Epidemiology, I have not come across any recent data, good data on epidemiology over the last 10 years or so. I think the old data are, belong to quite some years back. Maybe someone ought to look at it again, um, but you're quite correct to point out that nowadays uh, the woman coming for IVF, assisted conception, tend to be getting older too. So I think there is a, uh, another gap in the knowledge about the fibroid uh, 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 epidemiology. But in addition, I think with better imaging technique, we might find the prevalence of fibroid would be higher because we are now can detect, detect smaller fibroids, and we can more accurately locate the, the, these fibroids, whereas before we are detecting fibroid by, by other less sensitive techniques. Which brings back to the point, second point that you asked about mapping. What method should we do? Now I'm in favor of 3D scan. My prejudice is in 3D. The reason being 3D scan is getting more and more popular. Most people in your department would now have a 3D scan. Uh, and it's not difficult to do if you know how to do 2D. To acquire 3D skill is actually, I have to say, that it's not that difficult. Although to be a real expert in that requires a bit of practice and training. I think it's much better than CT and much better than MRI scan because the latter two are more expensive. And they, they may not necessarily give you a very good handle on, on exactly. You have to know, learn how to interpret it as well. 3D, you can repeat the measurements quite readily in your department, in your unit, and you can, and, and it's also not difficult to read. Uh, and as a follow-up procedure, for example, when after you've done the initial myomectomy, you want to do a second note, you can assess the residual fibroid. And I think a 3D got to be the way forward. And I know that in our, in our group, in the SIG group and, and in the ASTRI, 
there is a lot of talk about introducing 3D scan, training the next generation of surgeons to get better imaging skills. And I think the best person to do the imaging is the surgeon himself, rather than relying on another X-ray doctor or another radiologist doing it. Because if you do the, do the imaging yourself, you have a better understanding of the anatomy. I don't think that a radiologist or imaging doctor would have a better understanding of anatomy than a surgeon himself. A surgeon is trained to understand the anatomy. And there's instant feedback when you look at the fibro, when you go to the operating theater. Whereas an imaging specialist, I know we have very good imaging specialists sitting here, he doesn't have the feedback straight away instantly. Whereas a surgeon, the feedback is instant and very gratifying to know that what you have done before the operation helps. So this is my prejudice. Thank you, Professor Gortz, and after the, you can go to the microphone to, Thank to keep time. Thank you very time. much, uh, TC, for this wonderful presentation as usual. Uh, Thank you. Now, I have a few questions. Uh, I completely agree that there is no evidence when we should operate yes or no, and that's because due to the heterogeneity of the different forms of and the numbers of myomas who are, are present. But at a certain moment, you are faced with a clinical problem. I mean, if you see a patient with an intramural myoma of three centimeters and she has to go to IVF, then the question is, should you operate or not? Or should you wait for one IVF failed or two IVF failures, etc.? So, and I believe because of the heterogeneity from the different myomas, we will never be able to, uh, to perform a prospective randomized study. It will, be, it will be impossible to do so. So that means that we, have, we must look at other points uh, and to find some scientific evidence why a myoma is interfering with reproduction or implantation, yes or no. Can you elaborate in some way to what we should be looking for uh, to find an answer on that, on that question? Thank you so much. Uh, well, uh, there are two answers to your question. One is, what could we do now? before we have very good quality evidence to help us. I think now what we can do is to individualize our judgment, our decision. For example, in the case of a three centimeter fibroid, if I were sitting in the clinic, I would say, look, the three centimeter fibroid is it quite close to the junction of zone, or is it very f quite near to the serosa? If, so if it is near to the junction of zone, I have a lower threshold to operate. If she had miscarriage history, I would have a lower threshold. If she had gone through IVF already once or twice and not successful, I have a lower threshold. So these important factors all come into the equation. There is no randomized control trial data to tell us these are important, but these are a surgeon's individual assessment of the case. So at the moment, because there's lack of good quality evidence, then we have to individualize our judgment. Secondly, coming back to the question on the longer term, how do we collect the data? How do we proceed to collect? I think we have to undoubtedly do randomized control trial at some stage, but that, that makes an assumption that we understand the biological behavior of the fibroid very carefully. For example, when you're just looking at intramural fibroid, when you operate on them, you do a randomized control trial, without realizing that intramural fibroid could be so heterogeneous. When you do a randomized trial, you've got a wrong conclusion because you do not specify the distance between uh, the junctional zone or the uterine cavity and the fibroid. So I think with better imaging technique, in the future when we're planning study, we should carefully map out the fibroid, the exact location. We should also look at are the fibroid causing functional disturbance, for example, does it call, increase the contractility? Uh, does it cause excessive contractions? So all these things are important. I think the more basic science we understand about fibroid, the, the better we are in a position to uh, collect data. Uh, it won't surprise me that it will take us another five to 10 years. Even with effort from different, uh, different surgeons, it will take us a long time to collect good quality evidence. So I hope that to some extent answered the question. They're not easy answers, I know. But I hope we as a group can help. Good okay. morning, sir. It is a nice talk. Uh, 
basically my question is on multiple fibroids that has been because whenever we get lot of patients with uh, not a single fibroid say one large fibroid and there will be different multiple fibroids we opt the patient for it, removing the large fibroids uh, so would you advise removing the other fibroids anyway patient is going to undergo a laparoscopy thank you for the question uh, this is a very common clinical dilemma when you have a multiple fibroids then uh, it is a difficult decision I have to say a single large intramural fibroid is easier to make a decision. When you have multiple smaller fibroids, the decision for surgery is always difficult and to what extent you want to take out a very tiny fibroid when you're doing surgery. Uh, my answer to the question is, firstly, I do not believe one should take out every single small fibroid during the surgery. We need to think which are the fibroids that is causing the problem. Well, if they are very tiny and you have to dip very deep, deep down to create a big incision, uh, a big scar in the uterus, that might not necessarily be in the best in the patient's interest. The second point I'd like to make also is, I, again, my prejudice is, I think larger, smaller, uh, solitary large fibroid is perhaps better to have surgery. But multiple small fibroids, if they do cause problems, maybe that's when non-surgical approaches would come into the equation like, like uh, the one Geddes is going to talk about, focused ultrasound therapy, or even medical treatment like Ulipristol. So I think uh, different type of fibroid may require different strategies uh, and on top of their behavior, on top of their reproductive outcome. So again, I haven't quite completely answered your question, but I hope I've given you my own view about how to manage multiple fibroids. Not easy. <clears throat> okay, the last question, please. Thank you. Uh, Professor, what do you think uh, about doing hysteroscopy and laparoscopy after uh, myomectomy, six uh, to eight weeks, to prevent uh, synechia intrauterine and uh, adhesion uh, in the pelvic uh, cavity? For infertility, of course, when we do myomectomy for infertility. Okay, now that, that's a good question. Now, I, I have to divide my answer into two different parts. One is adhesions in the uterine cavity, and the second is adhesion in the peritoneal cavity. Now, I would not be in favor of doing routine laparoscopy to root out and manage adhesion that are developed over the cerosal surface. You could. However, it would cost money. It would be another operation to increase the morbidity of the surgery, and it would cost money and all these things. So. Uh, unless the patient have symptoms, I don't think we should routinely offer doing a second laparoscopy to check for adhesion inside the cavity, inside the, peri the peritoneal cavity. However, in the case of intracavity adhesion, that's a different matter. Now, intracavity adhesion causes much more problems because when you put an embryo back, if there are adhesions, the embryo won't stick, it won't implant. So there is a debate whether or not we should routinely check for intracavity adhesions. But if you want to do that, you don't necessarily need to do a hysteroscopy. There are other methods that you can do. For example, you can do a SIS. You might be aware that there are now two very good quality randomized trials on hysteroscopy before IVF published in Lancet earlier this year, only about two months ago. It says that hysteroscopy has been overestimated before IVF, and that if the ultrasound show no evidence of any pathology, perhaps hysteroscopy is not, necess not necessary. In contrast to what we believe up to the uh, beginning of the year, that hysteroscopy is very useful. I think now ultrasound, particularly 3D ultrasound, along with SIS, when you put a bit of fluid in the cavity and distend it, it could visualize the cavity very clearly, and you will know whether or not there is lesion. But not only that, uh, so Terry sitting here has pioneered some work. When you've got a small amount of adhesions, you, when you put the water, when you put in the balloon, you can remove the adhesion at the same time. So it's not just a diagnostic possibility, it is a therapeutic opportunity. And I would say in those women who have uh, fibroid before, perhaps this is something that we should consider, especially your concern, or especially if the patient goes for IVF, or especially if the woman become oligomenorrheic after surgery. Definitely. I think this is something that we should think about more uh, to reassure our patient that 
there is no significant injury transplantation that develop after the surgery. Just one last point that I want to say in connection with this. Prevention is always better than cure. Now, when you have two intramural, oh, sorry, two submucosal fibroids, one in the anterior wall, one in the posterior wall, you might wish to do the surgery at two different settings. Because if you do it on both one setting, you've got a raw surface on the anterior wall, you've got a raw surface on the posterior wall, the incidence of adhesion after surgery is much higher, four to five times higher than you've got one solitary submucous fibroid. So you may wish to consider it doing it in two separate settings, or if you do prefer to do it in one setting, you must employ measures to prevent adhesion, like putting in a balloon, a Coke balloon. I have no shares in, in Coke, I have to say, declare, <laughs> although I use it very often. You have to put in some mechanical barrier to stop the two surfaces from sticking together. And you must, on our discussion, always offer a, a, a SIS six to eight weeks afterwards to rule out if there's any adhesion. So these are the options. So I hope that that answers your question about adhesion formation. Okay, so we have to move, please. Thank you again, Professor Lee, for the discussion and the nice presentation.